Well, today we're sitting here with Lee Brandenburg, the primary owner of Cinnabar Hills Golf Course, which he built roughly 18 years ago. He had some memorabilia, golf memorabilia, that he had collected through the years, and he decided to build a small golf museum known as the Brandenburg Historical Golf Museum. Uh, the museum has built to become a much larger museum, one that is probably not uh, duplicated in the United States. There's, there's probably a half a dozen golf museums in the United States, but I think very few can come up to your level. So Lee, uh, I congratulate you on the effort that you've done through the years. Uh, when did you start playing golf? Oh, probably as I was in high school. I was pretty bad. <laughs> Still not that very good, but... Uh, well, when did you start developing, start saving golf items, purchasing golf items? Do you have any idea? Or it was just accumulation through the years? Yeah, as you go through the golf life that uh, all of us live, uh, you just keep picking up experiences, and with this experiences, you pick up some memorabilia along the way. And it's kind of then you look at it, and it reminds you of the old days. I think it was just doing what comes naturally as you played in tournaments and uh, saw tournaments and were able to get a hold of different items from golf. Uh, it uh, gradually built up until I thought, well, might as well put some cabinets in here at Cinnabar Hills and fill them with golf memorabilia. And it I can always remember, I remember 10 years ago, you and I having lunch and you were talking about how important it is for kids to know history. And I can see that your love for history, your love for golf, and your love for educating with all the memorabilia in here for youngsters uh, learning golf and, and learning the history of golf. Because history is so important to you and you felt that history is important to youngsters too, you know. Absolutely. So, uh, so uh, you have to be commended for all the efforts that you put in there. Well, that's what history is all about, to uh, get these different pieces, some of which are one of a kind, uh, but all of which really have a great story behind them. You like stories, you know, and we're trying to do more stories in the museum, but you've written books about history. I just know that history is in your blood. History never gets old. So that's why we have the museum. That's so. Absolutely. Those that forget history are doomed to suffer by it, whatever that quote was. Or? Something similar to that. Yeah, you're yeah. more articulate than I am. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's been 20 years, almost 20 years since we've opened this golf course. And I was privileged enough by your invitation to play it when we first opened it. And I can't believe that now we're sitting here talking about what a fine golf course it is, how the museum has grown. Uh, I would hope that you're proud of what's, what's been accomplished here. Yeah, I'm very proud of, uh, of everything here. I got it from so many different sources and all friends from golf all over the country and all around the world also. Well, you know, when, when you started at the museum was maybe 15%, 20% of what it is now, and you just continue to add some pretty unique things. Yeah, as you go along in golf, you just get more and more stuff from more and more people. Your history in golf has been great, and you've played with a lot of good players through the years. you played with a lot of celebrities through the years. And one of the pride possessions we have in the, in the museum that you've got, I think a number of years ago, was the green jacket, President Eisenhower's green jacket. So I happen to have it here, which I'm sure you're very proud of. And I, I just let you show me how you know it's President Eisenhower's. It's very unique in that every member has their name on it somewhere. Yeah, they do. And this is Dwight D. Eisenhower's jacket, and there's his name, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to meet Eisenhower <clears throat> out at the Augusta National when I was a second lieutenant at Camp Gordon, which is now Fort Gordon. Uh, saw that Eisenhower was gonna play golf that day and I just thought in my naivety that I would go out and watch Ike play golf. Well, when I got to Magnolia Lane, which is the drive in to the Augusta National, there was a bunch of, car, of police cars out there, highway patrol and secret service, the whole thing. So I drove down the road and 
Lo and behold, about 400 yards down, there was a path. I drove down, turned, wheeled in, turned left toward the golf course, went down the path, parked my car under a tree and walked out on the fairway. And at that moment, the second of two fellows was teeing off and I knew it was Eisenhower because he had uh, Ed Dudley, who was the pro there since 1934, and they were playing together. And <clears throat> when the Secret Service man came up on my side, he said, what the hell are you doing on this golf course? It's closed even to members. I said, well, I just drove my car in down there and it's parked right over there and here I am. So he said, well, wait till the general puts out and then get the hell out of here. <laughs> so they put it out and Ed Dudley took off for the second hole, which was in the opposite direction. And Eisenhower was facing me, picking his ball out of the hole and couldn't resist coming and seeing a second lieutenant in uniform came over and I suited him and said, I said, congratulations, General. We talked for a few minutes and then he took off with his game of golf. And so I was a happy camper. He probably was uh, the president that was most interested in golf. So when you had the opportunity to purchase that jacket, I'm, I'm sure you were pretty excited about that. Yes, yes, I was. I, I, um, this is probably the prime piece in the museum, uh, along with <clears throat> Walter Hagen's captain's jacket. The green jacket is given to the winner every year and uh, all the members, and the members are not supposed to take it off the facilities. They gave out the first jacket in 1949 to Sam Snead. The Masters started in 1934, and you have a lot of memorabilia in there for the, the yeah. initial Masters, including a copy of the initial program. And we have a clock that, uh, that was hung in, in Augusta for a number of years. Yeah. But uh, they don't know where, who suggested the green jacket concept, but the first one was given out to Sam Snead in uh, 1949 when he won. Yeah. I don't know the story, but do you don't, know, don't the know the story, story behind that? There's really no story. They, someone came up with to give the winner a jacket, and that was the first year. Uh, Clifford Roberts decided to give it, and Clifford Roberts, who was one of the founding members with, uh, founding owners with Bobby Jones, uh, he, uh, he can't remember, he did, couldn't remember who suggested the green jacket, but that's when it started. Okay. And you know, when we start talking about Bobby Jones and Augusta and all the different pieces we have, this piece is very striking to the viewers that walk through and, and see it. There's only a few of those. Can you tell me a little bit about what that putter is? Yeah, well, this is Calamity Jane, the putter that Bobby Jones won the U.S. Open in 1923. And this is a sterling silver replica of that club and I um, feel very fortunate to have been given this club. Tom Cousins gave this away to the winner of the, uh, of the golf tournament at East Lake Country Club. The Tour Championship. Which, yeah. The Tour Championship, which was the club that Bobby Jones first belonged to in Atlanta when he was a kid when he was, when he was 14 years old. Yes, yeah, that's where he grew up. Yeah. East Lake. We have, uh, we have some memorabilia of East Lake. We have a scorecard of East Lake and a book about East Lake and uh, in reference to the Bobby Jones section, you know. Yeah. And we also have a, a special piece and special memorabilia besides that one of uh, Bobby Jones is we have teaching books and you flick through them and it shows them in kind of hitting the shot. And those are very unique. Those are, are, I don't even know, you probably don't remember even where you got those, maybe with Frank, but those are very valuable and very unique. Uh, they uh, really are. I've yeah. never seen them any place else. Yeah. Yeah, Frank Christian, tell us a little bit about Frank. His father was the official photographer of the Augusta National starting way back when it started. Uh, I think he was see, back there in 31, even though the course opened in 34. And he was the official photographer until 1952. And then his son, Frank Jr., took over at that time and was the official photographer until just a couple of years ago. And you, when you did meet Frank Jr., uh, you became good friends and you've done a lot of traveling and visiting with him. You stay at his house, he stays at your house. You've become close personal friends, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Frank is... Uh, is a really interesting guy. Uh, we were just with him a couple of weeks ago. At the Masters. 
uh, Frank uh, every year gives a talk for a big group of people at the Masters because Frank knows more Masters history than, than anyone since his father was connected since 1931. And uh, he just grew up with the Masters. Bobby Jones gave Frank Christen his first golf lesson, uh, gave him a five iron yeah. when Frank was six years old. I really enjoyed, uh, you introduced me to Frank about four or five weeks ago. and. It, it, it is fascinating to listen to his stories and hear him talk all about Augusta and, and the caddies at Augusta and, and just everything about Augusta. It was, and, and some of the memorabilia you've worked closely with him on. Even non-Augusta memorabilia, he is a collector in his own right. And uh, he's, he wrote, his book is quite interesting. He gave me a book and I read that too. But uh, yeah, he's a fascinating guy for sure. In the museum, we have a couple jackets. You yeah, well, we got uh, Walter Hagen's jacket when he was captain in 1927, 29, 31, and 33. The great Sir Walter. Now, was he a playing captain or was he just yeah, I a captain? I believe he was a playing captain all yeah. through that, yeah. I think so. We have another jacket in the museum. Tony Jacklin. Tony Jacklin's Ryder Cup jacket. Yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about Tony. I know you're personal friends with him. Not only do we have the memorabilia in the museum, but tell me a little bit about Tony, his personality and everything. Oh, Tony is a kind of a quiet guy. Uh, he started a golf course with Jack Nicklaus down in Florida called The Concession. And uh, we played that course together uh, opening day. And that was named after the when Nicholas conceded a putt to Jacqueline in, in 19, the 1969, Nicholas conceded the putt so that there was a half. America had already held the Ryder Cup, which is right here. They get to keep it, and so Nicholas conceded that putt. And you're right, uh, famous name now, the concession. And I know that he did this special piece for you. This is his hobby. And maybe you can tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, I'm John, sure. that's called... Uh, marquetry which is uh, evidently a whole bunch of pieces of wood that you cut out and then put together and that was Tony's hobby and he did that of, of uh, many different players and uh, combination of players and, and he was nice enough to do that of me. Um, I think it looks a lot like you. He's pretty talented. It really is. It's yeah. uh, As good looking as you are and as good looking as that picture is, well, I can't beat that, can you? That's pretty good for just a few pieces of wood cut out there, but uh, yeah, Tony caught the essence, I'm sure. It was, <laughs> it was really good. Well, we have a couple more in the museum, too. We have one of Tiger Woods and we have one of uh, uh, Marlon Brando. Is, That's right. Yeah, Tony yeah. did one so, of Marlon yeah, Brando. We have that. That's right. A little bit off of golf, but yet it's related to golf because of Tony doing it, you know? Yeah. And let's talk about one of our feature areas, and that's your trophy room. Your trophy room may be the only place in the United States that has the four major trophies, the Ryder Cup and the U.S. Amateur, all full size, not replicas. Uh, I'm really proud when I show people the museum and show them the trophies, uh, they can't believe it. So uh, we've had it, you've had it since 2003. So let's talk a little bit about Media Day, the Brandenburg Cup, and the trophies. Well, when we got all the trophies together, we decided, well, we better get a representative for each one of the trophies. So we had all five of them come out to Cinnabar Hills. Each one of them is pictured here with the trophy that they won, Tony Jacklin representing the Ryder Cup, Billy Casper, the U.S. Open, uh, Bobby Rosberg, the PGA, Bob Goldby, the Masters, and Doug Sanders, and they all came out and played, and we had a great time. We had the media. You invited the media. We had a big function afterwards, and, and it was a fun day. It was a, it was a special way to really set off the trophies. Thank so. you. Yeah, I congratulate John. Now, actually, as, as I sit here and talk to you, I congratulate John, the whole museum. Let's talk a little bit about the Ryder Cup. A lot of people know that the Ryder Cup happens every two years. It's become very competitive. But this one is my special piece. This is a piece that I love of all those out there. I don't know if you have a special, do one of those trophies attract you more than any of the others, or are you just proud of all six of them? I'm proud of all of them. Uh, Abe Mitchell is pictured on top of the Ryder Cup. Everybody always wonders 
who that is on top, and that's Abe Mitchell. Who Most people writer. think it's Sam Ryder. Yes, yeah, that's right. Ryder. And, and, and it he, is Abe Mitchell, no question. That was yeah. his teacher, yeah. And it has become one of the, along with the four majors, one of the exclusive tournaments Absolutely. Know, in, in golf. Absolutely. Incredible. You know? yeah. Every two years, all around the world, it's really something. Another thing we have in, in the museum that we don't have here in front of us is uh, there's a special piece of advertising, and uh, I always try to point it out to people. It's a, it's a Coca-Cola sign that has Gene Tunney and Bobby Jones on each end of the uh, sign. And both of those gentlemen did very little commercial business. And to see that sign, it's very special. And the next piece is one of our newest pieces in the museum. And uh, this is kind of special too, because now it's really older. It, we're talking about 1890s and so. Uh, it's a membership voting box. In, it's from the British Isles, whether it's Scotland, Ireland, or England. They all had them, the clubs had them. And as you can see, there's a yes part and a no part, and you take the ball, and there's probably a black ball and a white ball. Um, and uh, if you put it in this side here, it would be that you didn't want that, that person as a member, and if you put it down that way, it was, uh, it was yes. So. Yeah, it was really an interesting thing because most of the golf clubs, most of the smaller golf clubs had that. That's how you, be, you found out whether you were going to get in your membership or not, you know? Yeah, the question for me is so, uh, that a golf ball is white and if the term is blackballed, um, how would that person obtain the black ball to put it in there without people knowing before he put it in that he's putting a black ball in that. I don't, I don't know either, but the research shows that the word being blackballed from a club came from a voting, voting box like that, a golf ball voting box. They used, and also trying to find a black golf ball in those days might not have been too easy Well, maybe either. they didn't have a black golf ball. Maybe they simply had a golf ball. And I put think it that's in, more yeah. logical that you would have a, just a golf ball in your hand, but when you put it inside here, you could feel that Which part of it went down that way and part went down that way, and you knew that this was no and that's yeah. yes. This kind of an interesting thing. We had a... It dates back to 1890s, 1884, I think. It's, so it is, a, it is a unique antique for the, for the museum. It is, yeah. yeah. So. We're proud of that. One of the fascinating clubs we have is this guy right here. And the history of golf seems to be that it started in the Netherlands in a game similar to golf, but not true golf. Chloe, C-H-O-L-E. And uh, this is one of the clubs that's very similar to what they used in the Netherlands. It had, uh, had a metal head with two different directions. You would hit it with this end or you'd scoop it with this end. The ball that they used was a wooden ball like this, almost looked like an egg. And that's how golf started in, in the Netherlands. It went into Belgium. Belgium made their own version. Then it went into, uh, back to uh, the Scandinavian countries and they had the game called Cloven. Uh, and then at that point, it migrated to Scotland. And Scotland, uh, who claims to be the home of golf, they created golf courses, they created holes that you hit the ball into, flags, and so they really created the game as it stands today. Uh, and uh, so that's where they come up with the ancestry. But this guy is pretty rare, uh, so that's fun to have in the museum. And I think you got that a couple years ago. Uh, again, in another auction, uh, going through. To, that was mostly, I think you purchased that, mostly as you told me, for to round out the museum, to give the history part of the museum. Yes. And in our history side, you know, we probably have four, five, six dozen golf clubs, different generations. And then we have the tail coat, the captain's tails coat, uh, which in, in the UK, the captain is the most important person in the club. And usually a captain is elect, elected for one year, and they give that whole year to the golf club. They're there for every event, women's or men's. Sometimes a club will have two, two uh, captains, a men's and a ladies, but mostly just one captain. Uh, and you got, which I have never seen outside 
uh, the British Isles, the captain's tails coat. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's, uh, I'm not sure of the date. I don't know if anybody knows the date of it, but it was either from the 1890s or the first couple of the years of the 1900s. I understand that the fe a fella came over and saw the museum and then was interested and he sent you this special piece and with the letter that's on display? Yes, I was happy to get that. That's a, it's a wonderful piece. It really is, it's, it's very unique. And the pictures around it, some of the background pictures also kind of tell the story about it, so. It's a lot of pictures with gentlemen and captain's jackets yeah. through the ages, yeah. absolutely, up to pretty much the present, yeah. Yeah, we have, we have that British Open picture with the past British Open winners and the captain of the RNA there. Yeah, that yeah. was That was up to uh, a few years ago. One of the other things that we were talking about that in the, in the trophy room that I really didn't get to and I thought I'd step back and talk a little bit about it was, was the U.S. Open trophy. I remember uh, you got them in 2003, so this was probably 2002, maybe 2001. Uh, I was at the AT&T tournament and I get a phone call from you. I was staying at the lodge and uh, you said, John, I understand that you have a concern about me buying these trophies and uh, that you don't think it's a good idea. And I said, well, it's not that it's not a good idea, but I'm more concerned with how tournaments would react. You know, are you buying them? Can you show them and stuff like that? I didn't want you to buy them and then have them stop you. Uh, the only one that really reacted uh, was the uh, U.S. Open and I got a letter from the Open and uh, it said uh, we understand that you have a exact full-size replica of our trophy and uh, we would like to, to send it to us and we will melt it down and send the sterling silver ball back to you. That was followed up really by a call from three of the officials of U.S. Open and uh, they said what I had to do and I said I've got a story to tell you. The upshot of that story was that Harry Easterly, the executive director of the USGA from Richmond, Virginia, quit over this situation. At one point you had talked to the USGA about maybe developing a golf course with them and in partnership or give them the land or something? Do you remember that story? Yeah, I had about 300 acres along the Chattahoochee River, the main river, large river going through the center of Atlanta, and I offered uh, them 240 acres to, off the USGA, 240 acres to build uh, their own golf club and golf course and put their um, their main buildings there, their library and their headquarters and everything, and move it down from Far Hills, New Jersey. Jim Gableson with the USGA was visiting and staying with me at Pebble Beach, and uh, they all came to vote at the time that they played it at the US Open in 1982 at Pebble Beach. And I'll never forget that I was standing by the door, door as Jim Gableson came walking down with his head down, walking down our front steps, and and I said, you lost, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I can't believe it. it. Must have been eight to seven, it was a secret vote, but the upshot was that they said that the seat of golf was in the Northeast, which wasn't true because the delivery of the first clubs noted in the United States came into Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, of course, several major happenings uh, in the Carolinas and Georgia. And to, I, I guess, to his credit, it, uh, to verification is that the USGA is still in Far Hills. They haven't moved from Far Hills. So uh, whoever had the deciding vote was pretty strong because they're still there. Yeah. And they have no golf course. And, and they have no golf course. And they're not on a bluff overlooking the great Chattahoochee River yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia, where they draw easily at the beginning 120,000 people, whereas in Far Hills they drew, drew 6,000 people a year. Well, there's a positive to the end of that story because had you done all that, this museum would probably be 
over there and not here. So we get to enjoy the museum as opposed to it being. That's right. Uh, you had a home at Pebble Beach for a number of years uh, on the second hall. Uh, just out of sidetrack, you now have a home at Pebble Beach again on the second hall. There was a little bit of a few years in between, but you had some great Crosby days. I remember some of the uh, guests you had, professionals, celebrities, parties you had on the second hall. Uh, and those must have been some great times for you. We, uh, we had a lot of fun. I know you were close friends with Gabe Brewer, who stayed yeah. with you a number of years. Yeah. Bobby Nichols yeah. stayed with you. You know, we talk about young golfers now. They don't know Gabe Brewer. They don't know Bobby Nichols. You know, they don't know Tommy Aaron. They don't know okay. Gabe, uh, Glenn Campbell or Glenn Tanya Campbell. Tucker. Tanya Tucker, yeah. Yeah, stay, yeah. yeah. You, you, you were a man of all trades. You didn't go just for professionals. You also went for celebrities. You know? Yeah, Jack Lemmon never stayed at our house, but he spent a lot of time over there because um, uh, his wife was a rather volatile uh, type, and, uh, and he used to come over to, uh, from his room at the lodge to, uh, to hibernate at our place. and Kind of sneak out for a little free time? Get his focus back, whatever Jack's focus was. Uh, well, I'm not sure in the Crosby, I'm not sure that anybody had a focus. That was more of a good time than a golf time. It was a great time then. It was a matter of a pro bringing his friend along or, or a celebrity bringing his pro along. And it was a real friend to friend type of situation today. It's, uh, it's quite a bit more it, impersonal. It's a business. Were you ever, uh, were you friends or did you meet Bing Crosby? Would, uh, that was Never met Bing Crosby. Uh, uh, I was friends with Catherine Crosby, his wife, and good friends with Nathaniel Crosby. Uh, I uh, got involved in the Crosby in my golf career in the 78 when Bing had just passed away. And uh, of course, we have a good friend, Bud Giles, who's since passed away, but he was real involved in it too. So I knew that you and Bud were close. We were and, very close. And a lot Bud. of the memorabilia that we have it from the Crosby is, is through Bud. Absolutely, you know? yeah. yes. He was a good man. And, and then it turned into the AT&T, and, and uh, I don't think you ever played in the AT&T. You did play in the Crosby. Did, do you remember who you played with by chance? That was yeah, a long time played, ago. Yeah, uh, played at least four years with Chip Beck. Uh, maybe five. So that's how you became really good friends with Chip. Yeah. Talking about Chip Beck, we got a bag right here, which brings up a couple more museum pieces. Okay. Chip Beck shot 59. These are the golf clubs he shot 59 with. Those are the clubs that he used to shoot 59 with right there. Right here. Obviously, I know how you got those because, as I said, you and he are good friends. Your whole families are good friends. Yeah. And then we have another special set of clubs that are for Mr. 59. Al Geiberger. Al Geiberger. Yeah. And we have those clubs. And the year he shot, 59? 1977. That was the first 59 on the PGA Tour. Yes. He played with his close friend, oh, Dave Stockton. Dave. And uh, they say that that's still the best 59 because of the golf course it, that it was played on and, and everything. So who knows? There's been a few 59 cents. But those are special things to the museum. A lot of people are interested in that. Yeah, do you remember at all how that you came about the Guy Berger Golf Club? I had met his wife, and I really didn't meet Guy Berger till a couple of months ago down in Florida. So we go from the AT&T to the Hope. Again, celebrity-wise, you had pros and celebrities, but you played with presidents, you played with actors, you were, I won't say a good friend of Frank Sinatra, but you spent some time with Frank Sinatra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, my wife, Diane, she was good. She knew Frank better than I did, but uh, yeah, Frank was uh, was a good fellow. We played in his tournament, played in the first Frank Sinatra, and played in the first couple of Frank Sinatra tournaments, uh, probably in the early 90s again. Did you enjoy the time at the Hope as much as you enjoyed the time at the Crosby? Was it similar? Oh, the Hope, yeah, the Hope was a lot of fun. The Crosby was, uh, was a tougher go because it was a two-man best ball, and there was some pressure in the Crosby uh, with a two-man best ball, whereas in the Hope, uh, it was a best ball foursome and you could just, you could just walk along and never, never contribute a, to a hole. And, and still nobody, enjoy it. Nobody knew the difference. Uh, do you miss live, having a place down there at all and playing golf down there? 
Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great place down there. Is it? Well, in the museum we also have special sections on professionals, the Jack Nicholas section, the Gary Player section, we have a Gay Brewer section because of your relationship with him. Uh, we have also a special section that probably most museums don't have, and that's uh, a fellow by the name of Jack Fleck. Tell us, tell us what Jack's famous for. Well, Jack was famous for winning the 1955 U.S. Open at the Olympic Club. He was a complete, utter unknown. He was staying at a little motel in Daly City and room 14, and, uh, as a matter of fact. That was a uh, gigantic surprise, and, uh, and that is the last time that I ever left a <laughs> sporting event before it before was over. It because sometimes the fat lady doesn't sing till late in the event. I was out there when Chip Beck was second, was, was fighting uh, Bernard Longer to win the Masters. And, and um, they were playing together and uh, Chip uh, hit not his best drive. And he told me later that, uh, since we had played a bunch of times, uh, told me later that he, he just didn't know if he could make the shot. And so he laid up. Uh, on, number 15, on number 15, uh, on the par five, and uh, everybody crucified him for that, for doing that. And uh, he said, the problem was I, I hit a bad shot. I sculled the next shot over the green. If I had knocked it close uh, from right down below about 40 feet from the water, uh, everything would have been just fine. I sculled it over the green, and luckily chipped back and made a five, but unfortunately Longer was making a four, which put him two shots up, and, and he won the uh, Masters that year. I'm just sitting here and hearing you say Masters, U.S. Open, uh, Ryder Cup. Have you attended all of them? Have you attended a British Open? Yes, yeah. Have you attended a U.S. Amateur? No. I caddied in the U.S. Amateur 1999. Did at you Pebble really? Pebble Beach, yeah. Caddied and, for a fellow. And our mutual friend Nathaniel Crosby won the amateur in, in 1981. And then our friend uh, who gave us the U.S. Amateur trophy or arranged for us to get it because it had to be the to a winner, Sam Randolph, won in 1985, I believe. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. So you've been to those. Have you been to a PGA Championship? Hmm. Good question. How about I'm not sure? Yeah, it's a good answer. Because I was curious after all the majors, because I know you've, you've been to many. I was just curious how many that was, you know. We have a full display of Ryder Cup stuff. Some uh, different books and some different, uh, you have starter sheets and, and things like that too. Yeah. 1952, San Jose State. On the way up, you've been a great supporter of San Jose State sports, athletics, and golf. Uh, we have a display showing some of that, some of the old teams, some of the teams with our friend Jerry Varum, his coach. Uh, Dick I'm, Schwenniger. Dick Schwenniger, yep, who uh, was my golf coach, actually. Yeah. Uh, not at San Jose State because I wasn't a good enough player to play at that level, but it was at community college. And our uh, present coach, John Kennedy, was a good, good man, all-American. Working yeah. hard at it. Yeah. Uh, for San Jose yeah. State. It's, it's kind of fun to be involved with the, the team. Yeah, Aaron Oberholzer, one of our players. Ventura Oberholzer, uh, Roger Malpe, uh, uh, to name a few. I actually ran into Roger uh, about two weeks ago, and I told him that we needed stuff for the museum. We don't have a Roger Malpe section. So you and I need to work on that. He lives too far away. He's yeah, about, about three miles. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's pretty far. I just got to catch him when he's at home. Yeah. yeah. Roger Malpe saved my life one time. It was my granddaughter's school, Castilea in Palo Alto, and Mac O'Grady was supposed to give the clinic out at Stanford for all of the big wheels and. Silicon Valley, whose daughter were going to 
passed away a well-known private school in Palo Alto and and uh, Mac uh, for some unknown reason was staying with us but for some unknown reason took off at eight o'clock in the morning and I just happened to be see him take off and I was sitting in the kitchen with my head on the table wondering what happened to Mac? What am I going to do? We got a clinic coming up for all these big wheels in Silicon Valley at Stanford. And Diane, my wife, said, call Roger. So I said, oh, Roger. Heck, it's 9.15 and it takes place at 11.15. She said, call Roger. So I picked up the phone. Roger said, well, I got some painters here, but I'll call you right back called back in 15 minutes, said, I'll be there. At 11.15, Roger was driving in in his gray Mercedes and, and gave the clinic, and nobody knew the difference between Mac O'Grady and Roger Malpe. In fact, they, Roger was probably I think more enjoyable. Yeah, I think personality-wise, Roger probably had it on him. Yeah, you know. he did. Mac O'Grady could hit balls left-handed and right-handed, but Roger could talk, talk his way around it a whole lot quicker. Yeah, you know? he could. At, and that day, he, uh, uh, Joe Montana's daughter was going to cast away, and he gave a lesson to Joe Montana, which we have a picture of in the museum. How much time did you spend with Ken Venturi? I know we had days with Ken that you'd, you'd see him. Uh, did you get to spend much time with him through the years? Well, yeah, on and off, sure. We, uh, we had days with Ken at Many of the golf courses around got to spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time with Ken. He was uh, he was a really unique individual. Uh, I believe he was ahead by four shots the last day of the Masters, 1956, and he lost by a shot to Jackie, Jackie Burke. Burke. His career ended. Uh, abruptly basically because of his hands and yes. then he went into a, a big uh, uh, TV career and, and really found his way. He was very good at that too. He really know? did. That, um, that saved Kenny uh, and he did very well for golf. Yeah. Well, you know, he was in that level that we have of professional, the Billy Caspers, the, uh, uh, well, all those guys, the Kerry Middlecoffs, the Sam Sneeds that didn't make a whole lot of money. They loved golf for golf. And, uh, and Kenny was in the same way, and so when he found his second occupation, it, financially it really helped him. Well, so, no. what really saved him golf-wise that Kenny came out of nowhere because Kenny was, I remember, because I was with Kenny, and he was really down. He was really down, and he won the Open. But it was that congressional, an, into the big heat when they had the, That's right, yeah. and he almost, he almost passed, yeah, passed out from heat from, frustration. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Kenny, at that point in 1964, yep. he had gone so far downhill that he was never considered a factor, and that again was, uh, Another was a fantastic big upset. Surprise. So yeah. he should have won in 56, but faded, and Burke came through, but, uh, and that saved his career. Well, to your, to your history and the interest in history, there's a lot of stories out in the museum with the Gene Saracens and the Sam Sneeds and Byron Nelson. There's a picture of you and Byron yeah. you and, and Nat Rosasco, who used to own Northwestern Golf. So, yeah, uh, Nat the, Rosasco. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures that, uh, for anybody that has time to spend, uh, keep seeing your face pop up in all those pictures with different people. But it's kind of fun, really, so we're going to kind of keep showing those as much as possible. You've been fantastic, absolutely fantastic for the golf community in Santa Clara and uh, Santa Clara County. And vice versa, John. Well, I don't have the history that you have, and, and the museum's fantastic. So uh, we just hope that when we're gone, you and I are gone, that the museum just continues to educate people, educate youngsters. We're going to do as you would like us to do and try to do some tours, get the junior golfers to learn about golf, and we'll make the museum as best as we can. And that's all due uh, to your history, to your interest in history. What we really need is more cabinets, but 
we don't know where to put them. The golf course has been really successful and the banquet area has been really successful and the museum's in the middle. And to think about when we started and you had a few cabinets, a few pieces of memorabilia and what we have now, we have two rooms full of fantastic stuff. Some of it's inexpensive but tells a great story. Some of it's expensive and tells another story. Uh, so it's just, it's fun to have around. It's fun to have you around telling us a story and uh, we can't thank you enough. Thanks for all your help, John. My pleasure. As you walk into the museum, there are a number of displays immediately to your right. This display really describes the golf clubs from basically the early 1400s all the way up to the present. It also has a little um, description of golf bags and golf balls, so it's a good entrance. It's a good way to enter the museum. We're really proud of this display. There are a number of clubs that are quite rare. In this section, which I call the Lee Brandenburg section, we have a number of pictures that uh, Lee has done uh, through the years, has had his picture taken with both celebrities and with professionals. Lee, you recognize any of those people in there? Oh yeah, yeah, Seve Ballesteros there and Clint Eastwood and there's Bob Hope over there and um, a U.S. Open, a British Open winner. Willie Mays is down there, right baseball there. player. Yeah, Roberto DiVincenzo. DiVincenzo. This is a funny looking golfer. Who's this guy though? He's yeah, a that's golfer. the Dalai Lama right there. I didn't know he played golf. Did he come to the museum? Not too or much it? of a golfer, but a heck of a guy. I'll yeah, tell you. a heck of a guy. Yeah. Also in this, in this section we have the, the, what I call the entrance letter from Lee, which is welcoming uh, people coming into the museum. So this is our special Brandenburg uh, edition of the uh, Brandenburg Historical Golf Museum. Well, this is our vintage section, Lee, and as you know, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of memorabilia here that you have collected through the years. The first three cabinets deal with Augusta National and Bobby Jones, one of the founders, along with Clifford Roberts. Uh, that's where we have the putter, the Calamity Jane putter. It's where we have the picture of where the golf course was built. And Berkman's Nursery in Augusta, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then quite a bit of memorabilia. You have a lot of badges that you have got through the years and just some special things along here. Also a, uh, a flag signed by the 2006 winner, Phil Mickelson. Is the Masters Clubhouse in the winner. And it also has something very interesting, is the logos that Augusta National used through the years. There's all the flowers that grew at Berkman Nursery on that plate right there. What they did here was they identified every hall and gave them a flower name. So every, every hole at Augusta National has a name of a flower. Right next to it, we have the Ben Hogan area. Ben Hogan, a famous golfer uh, that won many tournaments, had a beautiful swing, uh, got uh, hurt in a car accident, never thought he would play golf again, turned, out, turned around, got well, and uh, won the U.S. Open. That's right. Yeah, so uh, moving down a little farther, we'll go into the other sections. In these three sections, again on the vintage wall, we have the area that we talked about with uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower with the jacket. We have, this is the driver that President Nixon used, received from his club at Burning Tree, and a couple letters uh, from Dwight D. Eisenhower. This is the Walter Hagen section. Walter Hagen section has his coat from the Ryder Cup. And up top here, we have Tony Lima, also a golfer that Unfortunately, he was cut short in his career. He, he won a few tournaments and then died in a plane crash, 1964. So, uh, and he was from the Bay Area. Oh, San Leandro. Do you remember the nickname Tony had? Champagne Tony Lima. Why? Drunk a lot of champagne. And when he celebrated, then The he very won. first tournament he won, he bought champagne for the press. And the press tagged him Champagne Tony Lima. And from that point on, he was known as not Tony Lima, but Champagne Tony Lima. That's right. Next to us here is uh, the great Byron Nelson. Byron Nelson is known for winning 11 tournaments in a row in 1946. He won 18 tournaments in the year. Uh, he retired at age 34 uh, and was a gentleman in golf throughout, the year, uh, throughout his years. He put his name to a PGA event and uh, everybody loved Byron Nelson. He was a sweetheart. 
And this gentleman here happened to meet Byron. I don't know how well he knew him, but here's a picture of Byron and Lee. Uh, do you remember when that picture was taken? Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's Byron with Jimmy DeMeritt and Ralph Goodall and Gene Saracen. And Next to Byron Nelson is just a small area for Sam Sneed. Uh, Sam was known as a real character. Uh, he won 82 tournaments. He holds the record for most, uh, most PGA victories. Tiger Woods is chasing him. He's real close, but who knows if he'll get there now. But we'll have to see. But he was known as Slam and Slammy Seed. So this was our vintage wall. And then we move on to the special part of the museum. Lee's favorite, my favorite, and hopefully everybody's favorite is the trophy room where all the trophies are. This is the room that we're most proud of, aren't we? Absolutely, this yeah. is it. This is uh, the six trophies that we have. This right here is the Wanamaker Trophy for the PGA Championship. The trophy on the right here is the special trophy from Augusta, the Masters. Uh, this, is, this trophy is really heck to polish. I polished it the other day, it took me two hours. You have to try that sometime. There's over 700 pieces There's in that. There's over John. 700 pieces in that. In the middle, we have just all sorts of displays of different trophies. We have the, the voting box, where the membership voting box, and we, have, we actually have an Olympic torch in there. And the reason we have the Olympic torch is that golf is becoming an Olympic sport this year. And so now we have an Olympic torch to kind of make everybody aware that golf is now an Olympic sport. And then a lot of different trophies. Trophies come in all sizes and shapes, so it gives everybody an idea, whether it's crystal, or whether it's sterling silver, whether it's pewter. So. Here's uh, Francis Wiemet who won the Open in 1913, along with Eddie Lowry, a San Francisco boy who was 10 years old, the caddy for him, and uh, they, they were featured in the movie The Greatest Game Ever Played. Yeah, it was, it was a, it's a great golf story. It's, um, he was a caddy, and he just came out of nowhere to win the U.S. Open. Uh, and as there's a lot of history in the Bay Area for the caddy, and Lee, you might even mention that. What yeah. with Ed Lowry? What? Yeah, what, Eddie how Lowry. He... he played in the U.S. Amateur, and he was a he was a fine player, member of Cypress Point, and uh, he turned to be a San car Francisco. dealer in San Francisco, and then he employed a lot of professional golfers as they were growing up. Ken mm -hmm. Ken Venturi, uh, Harvey Ward, who was a famous player, uh, and a number of others. As we move on now, we've got the U.S. Open trophy here, one of the famous six ones. We have the most famous trophy in my mind, the Brandenburg <laughs> Cup, which is named after Lee Brandenburg, and he had a great tournament for a number of years. Okay, here we have the Ryder Cup, again, one of the famous trophies, and uh, we have a putter which was used by uh, Samuel Ryder, uh, the fellow on top of the Ryder Cup, who was Abe Mitchell. Okay. Abe Mitchell was... Uh... Samuel Ryder's teacher. Then we move back, and this is a really special trophy because not many people have this trophy. This is a U.S. amateur. Rather than a professional event, this is the amateur. Lee was good friends with the fellow who won it, Sam Randolph, and this is how we were able to obtain this a little bit. And there's a couple of names you might see here, how Sutton won the amateur, and Nathaniel Crosby, Sam Randolph. Billy Mayfair, Tiger Woods won it a couple of times, uh, Nicholas won it, Dean Beeman. Yeah, quite a group, U.S. Amateur Champions. It's a, it's a very special trophy. So, and then the last trophy we have is back here, is the British Open Clara Jug. Uh, again, not, you don't find this very often, but uh, it's a great piece, and it's from the, the Open Championship, as they refer to it, as opposed to the British Open. So, and the winner of this is referred to each year as the champion golfer of the year. A very English term, so. The Open champion. So those are our six trophies. We have a number of pictures that, on the wall that depict golf in its early stages. Well, these pictures here are all pictures that hang at the Royal and Ancient Clubhouse. Uh, in St. Andrews. So they're copies All of those. those pictures are copies of that, what they have on there. On this side of the wall, we have a number of special pieces. We have the layout from Augusta National. We have the special clock that was commissioned when the first tournament was. And we have the advertising that has Gene Tunney and Bobby Jones on it. Very, very unique piece. This wall I kind of refer to as the history wall. 
It has the old clubs, which we'll look at in a minute, and it has just a lot of old pictures, a lot of books, a lot of different things. It has a special captain's tails coat, which we've talked a little bit about, where a captain is a special person in the clubs in the British Isles, and uh, he's honored by being able to wear this at special functions. There's a great letter that accompanied the, the tails coat to Lee, that one of the members of another club in, in Great Britain brought it along. And Lee, you know the club. What was the name of the club? Royal Blackheath, wasn't it? Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. That was the first club, really, before San, predated St. Andrews. Yeah, so it's a very <laughs> famous spot in golf. It's not as big as St. Andrews, doesn't get as much interest, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a great piece of clothing. And, and again, it's one of the limited pieces in the United States. I don't know there's many. Number of pictures where you see previous captains getting together for a captain's dinner. And as you move down, here's our collection of golf balls. The how golf balls morphed from where they were to where they are now, featheries, all the way up to baladas and, mm -hmm. and different covers for golf balls. Uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, group of, of different types of golf balls. And I find that this is one of the areas that a lot of people in the museum stop and look at. In the entrance, we have different clubs, but we also have a lot of different clubs here. Clubs back, date back to 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, Masseys, Niblicks, mm -hmm. all sorts of different variations. Uh, John, wasn't this a club they hit out of the water there? With the open face, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, again, clubs that are illegal today are in here now because of variations. And then the rest of the wall is, again, just history. Old books, little trophies, different competition trophies and stuff. So it's kind of a fun wall to look at. Again, it's just our area of history. This wall here is referred to as the Stars Wall. We have the Legends Wall, we have the History Wall, and these are also legends, but they're newer, younger legends. So I refer to this as the Stars Wall. And we have the, the different signed flags, very much a tradition in golf. When you win a golf tournament, you, the professional gets the flag and he signs a number of them for different events and auctions and stuff. So we have special ones for the US Open, the British Open, the PGA Championship. So Lee has purchased these throughout the years. So it's kind of fun to have those on display. Next to us is Ken Venturi, close friend of Lee's and the Billy Casper section. Uh, both were very good friends of Lee spent a lot of time with Ken, spent a lot of time with Billy. They were really somewhat of the same vintage, although Ken stopped playing a lot earlier than Billy Casper did, and they both won major events. Did Billy Casper used to stay with you, didn't he? Yeah, Casper stayed with us. Ken stayed with us a couple of times, too. Ken and his wife went to San Jose State, and well, I didn't know him then, but uh, Ken, uh, 1956, uh, was going to win the, uh, the Masters. He didn't, but then he came through and what was it, 1984? 64. 1964, yeah. Okay, in this section we again have a couple stars. Tom Watson, there's a letter from Tom, a couple pictures from Tom, uh, and Tony Jacklin above. Uh, we talked about Tony Jacklin and his art, uh, how good he was at what he's done. There's a book that signed to, to Lee, as, as I said, they were quite good friends. And moving over, the, another close friend was Jack Fleck. Jack won the US Open. Uh, over Ben Hogan, and uh, Lee spent a lot of time with Jack in his later years, especially he and his wife spent some time at their house. And we won, we were there in, in the Olympic Club in 1955 when he won. Then as we move along, we got legends, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, Gary Player, Gay Brewer, all famous, obviously famous players that uh, Lee, Lee used to uh, play a little bit with. He played, there's a picture of Lee and Arnold Palmer playing, so uh, he, did, he played there probably in, the, probably in the Bob Hope. Yeah, it was in the Hope, yeah. 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 There's and, a picture of uh, Arnold Palmer with uh, Jack Nicklaus, and uh, Jack's got uh, a gal's uh, wig on, and what happened, we were standing there, and, and this gal's wig popped off, and I reached down and grabbed it, and, gave it to Arnold, and Arnold gave it to Jack, and they put there, it on, and, and then there it was, they started huh? dancing. You were responsible for that. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It yeah. was fun yeah. times. This wall here is our tournament wall. We refer to it as our tournament wall. Basically, 
It refers in this area to the Bob Hope Desert Classic, which Lee played in a number of years because he had a home down there and uh, played with a lot of celebrities and professionals. And then this area here is the uh, Crosby AT&T Tournament. Uh, a lot of memorabilia from the Crosby, a lot of uh, items from Bing Crosby and uh, some of the celebrities. In dealing with the Hope Wall, uh, there was, a, as Lee mentioned earlier, that was a group thing. The Crosby was an individual two-man team. A lot more pressure, a lot more fun in some ways and a lot more pressure in other ways. Uh, one of the things about the Crosby, which started a tradition, was these bottles that are up top in the case and the bottles throughout. Uh, they were Jim Beam bottles. Jim Beam has a collection of very motif bottles, all, all different sizes and shapes, but Bing Crosby started that, and every year they'd have a bottle, and Lee has collected those through the years. About forever. 30 of them, yeah. About 30 of them. Yeah, yeah. and that here. And, yeah. and some of the other tournaments did it too. Bob Hope had some, but basically it was started mm. at, at the Crosby. And then the other thing we mentioned a, a while back, we talked about a good friend of ours, Bud Giles. Bud was tournament director for a number of years, and he had a lot of this memorabilia. And these cars that are in the, in the showcase came along, and they used to give those. Lee, I don't know much about those cars, yeah, do you? they give that only to the pros. They gave a car each year's model of Oldsmobile, and they'd give each pro one of those cars. And that's a, probably not many of those around. It's a full collection of all the Oldsmobiles from every year that they gave one of those away. It looks kind of funny in a, in a golf showcase if you looked over here and, and saw the cars, but it does relate to the golf tournament. Most people don't even know that that, that happened. A uh, number of pictures of Bing Crosby and his friends uh, playing golf during the golf tournament. So. This is from 1944 during the war. Bing Crosby, Jimmy Fiddler, Bob Hope, and and uh, yeah, so that's that one there, 1944. Bing, Bing Crosby was an avid golfer, and actually he passed away on a golf course. And then our last little section on the very left is uh, a section devoted to uh, Gene Sarazen. Gene Sarazen was a famous player. Uh, he actually was the one who invented the sand wedge, a certain type of wedge in golf. Uh, number what in the 30s I think wasn't it, it, it yes yeah in the 30s yeah they, he won a 30s. number of major tournaments and uh, was called the squire his nickname so so as you look around this is the main museum this is this is most of the memorabilia there's uh, some Ryder Cup memorabilia there's some San Jose State memorabilia and now on the wall there's a number of letters from famous people Byron Nelson Sam Snead Ben Hogan yeah. uh, some, some letters that you'll never see copied anywhere else, so they're very special. You can spend a half a day to a day here at the Brandenburg uh, Historical Golf Museum, but overall it is just a special place to spend some time. And Lee, it's all because of you, so you did a great job. Thank and you. Congratulations. Same to you, my friend. Uh,